Okay, welcome to E200 week 4 lecture 1. Today we're going to wrap up CMOS logic. Now some administrative stuff. First of all, the updated syllabus is online. This reflects the fact that I have to spend uh, week 3 most of the time in the hospital. Now a uh, couple of other points. Please start working on the suggested problems by Friday of this week. The suggested problems are in the syllabus. And like I said, today we'll wrap up CMOS ideas. And next lecture, we'll get into basically the crux of the course, which is Boolean algebra and, and combination logic. The extra credit for this week is also up, and it's due again on Mondays. Note that since we did not have any extra credit for week three, this extra credit is basically 2%. So your extra credit total is still 10%. Okay. So CMOS logic, recall that this is the CMOS logic is basically the backbone, if you will, of digital logic design. So this CMOS architecture, that is, you have the pull-up network, which is PMOS, and this is pull-up network. And here is the power supply VDD. And basically, you can have N inputs here. But the point is, if the, and let's say you have a single output Y, if the pull-up network PMOS is in series, the NMOS, which is the pull-down network, is in parallel, and vice versa, that is the NMOS transistors are in parallel if the CMOS transistors are in series. So particulars, that's why it's called complementary. Okay. And recall that the PMOS is the complement of the NMOS in the sense if the input is one to the PMOS, it's off. If it's zero, it's on. And an example, so an example is, let's just do the inverter. Actually, let's do something more, uh, less trivial than the inverter in the sense, consider this logic gate, which we covered before break. So let's call this X1, let's call this X2. So if these transistors here are in parallel, the PMOS, the NMOS then is in series, and again, vice versa. And you can figure out what logic function this is. Uh, also recall, that the fundamental reason for the popularity of CMOS logic is that CMOS logic is or has, ah, has, well, almost zero static power dissipation but the dynamic but the dynamic power we'll talk about what dynamic power is shortly dissipation of CMOS is not zero and we need to understand this because non-zero dynamic power dissipation is due to the it's basically due to the charging and discharging of capacitors that's not why we need to understand this the point is this is also uh, due to the charging and discharging of capacitors is well let me do this way is due to the charging and discharging of capacitors this charging oops and my 
generator crashed, fortunately. Let's save this. Let's start over again. But basically, this charging and discharging of uh, capacitors This charging and discharging of caps, so capacitors are abbreviated, is also the source of propagation delay. Okay, recall your lab zero. So let's say consider an example that is the NOT gate. So consider the NOT gate. So let's say we have two inverters chained together. Let's call this node W. Let's call this node X. And let's call this node Y. And basically, this node here, node Y, could be connected to other devices. In other words, uh, what you have at node Y and node X, and even node W, but we don't consider node W for now, but basically at node X and node Y, you have what is called load capacitance or parasitic capacitance. So let's get into CMOS. So here's the power supply VD. So this is the first NOT gate. Here is W, here is X, and here is the second inverter. So basically what we have is node Y. But basically, at this node Y, you have what is called, this is a circuit symbol for a capacitor. And we'll shortly talk about the mathematical model of a capacitor. That's what we'll use, uh, the mathematical model. It's not hard to understand. We won't get into the physics of capacitances, which you will or you should have learned in your physics courses. And if you didn't, you will definitely learn them in electromagnetism. Well, uh, the physics you will learn in ENM courses and the circuit model you will learn in 2016 and 2070, but it's not that difficult, the capacitor circuit model. Okay, so basically what you have at this node is the load capacitance due to other devices. And at this node, what you have in this case primarily is these two gate capacitances. Recall that, let's call this CGP, the gate capacitance of the PMOS, and let's call this CGN. Recall that before break, we talked about how it's a metal oxide semiconductor and that basically acts as a capacitor. So here is your, what you could tell, um, what you could label here. C, I don't know, gate, okay? But the bottom line, uh, but another point to make is that if you consider, let me save this so I don't lose it. If you consider this node, it's kind of obvious as an engineer that the more devices you have connected here, the more is this load capacitance. So basically, it, that what I just said is quantified by something called fan out is the number of devices that can be connected or it's the maximum number of devices that can be connected externally for proper device functionality. And we will see shortly why capacitances, uh, charging and discharging requires energy and consequently delay, etc. But before then, uh, Uh, what is first of all meant by dynamic? We haven't really talked about that. Dynamic is basically when signals are changing. In our case, when signals change from 0 to 1 and vice versa, that is from 1 to 0. Okay. Note that we have capacitances at nodes X and Y that require energy, and we'll see shortly why, um, that require energy to charge 
and discharge okay so in other words cg is obviously cgp plus cgn okay this is at node x and at node y we have c load but the bottom line is uh, before we look at what so let's actually uh, consider only the CG capacitance. The analysis, what I'm going to do, works very similar for C load. But basically, when W goes from a 0 to a 1, correct, uh, the initially, the PMOS transistor is on, so VDD, that is when W is 0, VDD comes to node X, and that makes sense, because when W is 0, input is 0, output is high, it's an inverter. So this capacitor is charged to VDD, if you will, and we'll see shortly when you look at the mathematical model, why all this makes sense, the mathematical model of the capacitor. But when W goes from 0 to a 1, the NMOS transistor now turns on, so the capacitor discharges to the NMOS transistor, and that takes not only time, but it also takes energy. So to understand all this, we need the mathematical model of the capacitor, and for that, we'll use the trivial model, that is, trivially, a capacitor is a two-terminal device that stores energy in the electrostatic field or E field or let me just write in an electrostatic field I won't talk about between the plates etc so in other words, here is a circuit symbol that we'll use for a capacitor. So I put current, okay? I induce charges on this plate, okay? So since the device is initially electrically neutral, you get a negative charge here. So you develop a voltage difference. So in other words, there's a, the fundamental relationship for a capacitor is Q is a function of V, for us it's a linear function, so C times V, where C is a constant called capacitance. So the units of C are in farads, okay, named after Michael Faraday, so this is called capacitance. Now to get I from this equation, if you take the derivative of this equation, so if you take DDT, you get I on the left hand side is C dV dt plus V DC DT using the product rule, we assume capacitance is constant. So this is what we get. The sense we get I is C dV DT. Let me save this. So and there's obviously a picture that goes with this equation. So here is I is C dV DT, and the picture, the passive end convention is this. But what is the energy associated with the cap? That's the question we want. So the question is derive the energy associated with the capacitor V, capacitor what am I saying? C, that has. V volts across it, steady state, let's call this VF, V final. And the solution, the answer, it's very trivial in the sense, recall from basic circuits that power associated with the device is P is V times I, but you know I is C dV dt, and the power is the rate of doing work or energy, and as if we assume initially that there was no energy in the capacitor, it was fully discharged, and finally, and there it goes again, this is really annoying in the sense my journal editor is not very stable. So anyway, W is basically, let me make sure I'm still recording, yep, so you get to a final energy and what is the energy is what we got to find so this is dw dt is the integral c is a constant so you can put it outside the integral sign so initially there was no voltage 
we finally go to a final voltage, we get V D V D T. This is a W. So if we apply calculus, we get WF on the left hand side where the fundamental theorem of calculus is C times integral. I'll integrate this step by step. That is V is zero to VF. V D V integral of V D V is V squared over two. And if you apply the limits, you basically get is crashing so often nowadays. We basically get W final is one half C V final square. So recall this is very similar to the kinetic energy expression from mechanics this makes sense we're considering the kinetic energy because it's a dynamic phenomenon that is we're changing v from zero to vf so we have one half m v squared the equivalent of it if you will therefore for charging a cap we expend one half cv squared for discharging we expend another one half cv squared that means during one cycle the energy work done is cv squared okay so what does like this one cycle mean so let's go back to a little cmos circuit and just consider the w and the x because like i said earlier the x and the y work similarly so here you have the total gate capacitance, Cg, and this is our x node here. So initially, suppose this is initially one, okay, that is the capacitor here, Cg, was charged to VDD. Okay, so, no, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Initially, this was uh, zero, that's what we looked at. So when this is zero, the output is one, the capacitor is charged to VDD, and when it goes from zero to a one, the capacitor discharges that energy and when you go back to uh, 0 to 1, 1 to 0, you charge it back up. So in other words, the work done in this case is Cg VDD squared, okay, which implies the power is work done over time taken. So it's work done times, uh, so power is work done over time taken. So this implies that the power is equal to work done is cg times vdd squared but what's interesting is one over t can be defined as f where f is the switching frequency of our waveform so in other words, this is the power associated with, if you think about it, this expression is actually technology independent. That is, if you have any node that has a capacitor CG charged up to a voltage to charge and discharge, this is the power required. So CMOS design, or in other words, IC technology is driven in many ways, or is dominated, if you will, by this equation, equation one, right? This implies that reduction in VDD is paramount, right? So if you want to reduce power, and it's obvious why you want to reduce power, this CG is a physical constraint, like you can't really do anything with this. Yeah, you can try reducing this by reducing fan out, etc. F, you don't want to reduce. And VDD is the catch in the sense the power goes down a square of the VDD. So VDD reduces by a factor of two or it, it goes down by one half, the power goes down by a quarter. Okay. So now you can hopefully understand from this very trivial but insightful discussion as to why uh, 
the IC industry is so obsessed with reduction in the supply voltage of your uh, Intel processors, for example. That's point number one. Point number two, this charging and discharging of cap takes time, and this is also what leads to propagation delay. Again, this is technology independent. So this expression is valid even for your FPGAs. Right? Yes, FPGAs do use uh, MOSFETs currently, but this equation we derived here is independent of, again, the technology. Now let's look at some other CMOS concepts. So here is the uh, here is a CMOS transmission gate, and this is important because this is one way you implement tri-state buffers that are uh, necessary for realizing bidirectional protocols such as I squared C, and you will cover. <coughs> excuse me this I squared C and other ideas in E2902 and beyond, but for but still consider this, right? So let's say you have this kind of topology. You have a signal S knotted going to the gate of a PMOS. The gate of the NMOS is connected to S and S is called select line, okay? So here is X, here is F, the truth table is the, and we can easily understand the way this works, that is S and F. There's not really a truth table in the sense it doesn't have zeros and ones. So let's call this a function table. It describes the functionality of this device. So when S is zero, this not S goes into the gate of the PMOS. So this is a one, the PMOS is off. So is the NMOS. So F is actually floating, okay? That is, it's an open circuit between X and F this is called high impedance state. Okay. And again, like I mentioned, this is used, transmission gates are used to implement tri-state buffers. So let me write that down here. So transmission gates are used to implement tri-state buffers, okay? So here's a symbol for a tri-state buffer. So here is a select line X and Y, if you will. But anyway, you'll cover this more in 2902 and beyond. But in S is one here, it's obvious that F becomes X because both transistors are on. And the circuit symbol for this is pretty interesting. Circuit symbol, it consists of one, two, three, four triangles. So here is X, here is F, there's a little knot here, and this goes into S complement, this is S, okay? And there is one more concept that we need to cover before we say goodbye to CMOS, and this relates to interfacing to other device families, and it's called the concept of noise margins. And basically the concept is, uh, physical voltage values are analog. That is, hence, zero volt is not exactly logic zero, but there is a range of voltage values and this is called this range is called the noise margin low that represent logic zero okay uh, correspondingly there is a range of logic of voltage values called noise margin high that represents logic one and the easiest way to understand this is if we recall, let me save this so I don't lose it. So recall the CMOS voltage transfer characteristic. Okay. That is, if I CMOS not gate voltage transfer characteristic, that is, 
let's call this let's do it this way let's call this v in let's call this v out here's our not gate so here is our v out here is our v in so what happens is let's say our lowest end v output low is zero volts and our highest voltage is the power supply voltage v output high but for a certain range of v in recall your mos analog model the output is high and then swings down to zero okay so there is a particular definition here and the definition is basically based on the slope of v out versus v in being negative one the slope here and same thing for the slope here but we are not going to be bothered with that because it gets into analog models and define this as v input low this voltage here and this voltage here is called v input high in other words we need these two definitions v input low is defined as the maximum input voltage that is recognized by our uh, device and in the case of CMOS it's different from let's say TTL which is transistor transistor logic but anyway this definition is the same that is the maximum voltage is recognized as logic zero so based on this we can define our noise margin on the lower end as V input low minus the output voltage for logic low again for CMOS the output voltage for logic low is zero volts that need not be true that is definitely not true for another technology called TTL uh, another technology say TTL transistor transistor logic and basically noise margins and variable power supply and and different power supply voltages is why you just cannot take a CMOS logic and directly connect it to TTL without these level translation ICs and this these ideas are very important for example let's say you take your FPGA and you want to connect it to a let's say a sonar sensor you have to make sure that the uh, logic values are compatible right? if not you can't connect them without these level translation ICs but anyway here's the definition of the lower or NML I say lower noise margin V input high is similarly defined as the minimum input voltage that is recognized as logic one this implies that noise margin high oops, is defined as v input high oops 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 it's wrong so let me put v output high here so it's v crashed again hopefully the final crash because we're almost done with the lecture okay good so in noise margin high is defined as V output high minus V in H okay So that's the third concept which I wanted to cover today and we're done with the CMOS. The moral of the story behind CMOS is that uh, transistors is how digital logic is currently implemented and you have these ideas of noise margins, uh, technology such as CMOS and propagation delay which arise out of charging and discharging of capacitors which all are prevalent irrespective of what kind of device we use. But particularly for our FPGA, for the rest of the course, we will basically cover Boolean algebra, which is how you specify digital logic. VHDL is how we specify digital logic onto our design platforms, which are FPGAs. All right, see you next lecture.